Hey folks, Andy Patton here. Today is Mailbag Monday and we are talking all about the transfer portal, NIL, and the impact it is having on Gonzaga's recruiting, Drew Timmy's future, Caden Perry's health, and much, much more all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag Athletics. I also want to thank all of you who have continued to make Locked On Zags your first listen of the day, and those of you who have checked the show out on YouTube. We are getting close to 600 subscribers on YouTube. The goal is 1,000 before the start of Gonzaga's basketball season in November. Plenty of time to get there, but if you are a listener to the show, you have not done so yet. Very simple. Just go to YouTube.com. Search Locked on Zags, hit that subscribe button. You'll see videos of every single episode that has happened in the last few months. You will see them organized in a fancy playlist if you want to see all of the season in review episodes, all of the Mailbag Monday episodes, whatever it may be. It's a fantastic resource to go through the old episodes for those of you who are interested in doing so. All right, today is Mailbag Monday. We got a ton of questions today, so we're just going to get right into them. This first question comes from Adam via Gmail. Adam says, when do transfers have to choose their new school? It seems like it has to be coming up soon, right? Yeah, so this is the new rule for this season. Uh, The deadline is May 1st for fall and winter sports, so that would include basketball. It would also include football. And what that deadline means, if you have not committed to a new school by May 1st, you are not guaranteed to to get to be able to play right away. You would then be subject to having to fill out an NCAA waiver and go through that process. Otherwise, you would have to sit for a year. So this is similar to what the the previous transfer rules used to be, where if you transferred at all, unless you were a graduate transfer, you had to sit out a year. Now that is still the case if you transfer or you go to a new school after May 1st. The first year in 2021, I think the deadline was July 1st, but that was because of the timing of when they introduced the rule. Going forward, the plan is for that to be May 1st. So you, if you are listening to this on Monday, that is six days away. So it is going to be a popping week in the transfer portal. All of those high-end players, many of the ones that Gonzaga has been connected to, are almost certain, certainly going to make a decision before May 1st because they would like to be able to play right away. So expect a lot of updates coming your way on the transfer portal stuff. Next question comes from John via Gmail. John says, why are the players that Gonzaga are targeting taking such a long time to make a decision? Why are we unable to get our targets to commit to Gonzaga as quickly as many of the other programs are? Recruiting both first-year players and transfers seems more difficult for Gonzaga for various reasons. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I'm sticking with the, the belief that I have kind of held throughout this process for Gonzaga regarding the transfer portal, regarding recruits. Uh, it's really the uncertainty about next year's roster. There are some NIL implications, and we're going to talk about that in a future question on this show. But I think the biggest thing that is potentially holding back some of the specific players who have chosen not to come to Gonzaga, and I think just other players that we may not even know all that much about, is simply not knowing whether Drew Timmy is coming back or not, not knowing whether Julian Strother is coming back or not, not knowing whether Rasir Bolton is coming back or not. And I think Gonzaga is pretty well set in wanting the starting backcourt for next season to be Nolan Hickman and Hunter Salas. That does not mean that very top-tier guards, players like Anthony Black or Sky Clark or Nigel Pack or any of the other transfers or recruits that Gonzaga has been targeting, they're obviously targeting those players. So they're willing to bring players in who would absolutely compete heavily with Hickman and Salas for starting roles. But for a variety of reasons, those players are choosing not to come to Gonzaga. Yes, some of them are probably choosing it because there are NIL opportunities that Gonzaga does not have. But I also think a lot of it is simply not not coming into a situation where you know you're going to play right away. 
if you were Sky Clark or Anthony Black and you thought I might come off the bench and I just, I'd rather go somewhere where I'm not going to come off the bench, where I'm going to be a starter right away. I think that that's a factor that is sometimes getting lost in the shuffle of people who are very concerned that all of the troubles that Gonzaga is having bringing in transfers and recruits this year are directly tied to NIL. I think it's playing a big part. I don't want to diminish the role that NIL is playing across all of college basketball. It's monumental. But I think for Gonzaga specifically with a handful of these players, it has more to do with the uncertainty about playing time than it does anything else. Next question on that same topic, multiple people asked about this. I'm just going to read the question that was asked by T-Bone Zag specifically. He said, with Nigel Pack scoring a two-year $800,000 deal at Miami plus a car, not to mention Oscar Shubway reported to earn two mil next season, how can Gonzaga compete? I don't think it's possible if this continues. I think one thing that I find fascinating about this is we're just holding this assumption that Gonzaga can't afford this. And I don't know why we have that assumption. Gonzaga has a lot of money. Do they have as much money coming into their athletic program as Miami or Kentucky or other programs that have football? No, not necessarily, but Gonzaga is not broke. (laughs) They have money. Drew Timmy made a lot of money last year. If he chooses to come back to Gonzaga, he's going to make a lot of money next year. So I, I don't think that Gonzaga is just going to get buried because they can't, they're completely broke and can't afford any of this. I think that that is kind of the sky is falling narrative that we're starting to see a little bit more that I just think a few weeks into the first real transfer portal uh, with NIL as an option, we're, we're only, we're, we're just scratching the surface of this. We're just, just getting started on what NIL looks like and how it impacts the transfer portal. And yes, up to this point, as I'm recording this on April 24th, It does not look like this is going particularly well for Gonzaga. It is hard to argue any other way. They have yet to make an addition to the roster, either as a late recruit in the class of 2022 or via the transfer portal. So, yeah, I can understand why there is some concern that when you see Miami flash, hey, we just gave this kid $800,000 to come to our campus, and he's a kid that Gonzaga was targeting. I can understand why there is a level of concern. I just don't think that we've seen enough to to really make these sweeping generalizations that this is some significant long-term problem. However, there is probably going to, at some point, need to be some adjustments to how this goes. If not for Gonzaga's sake, for even smaller programs that don't even have the resources that Gonzaga does. How are schools in the Big West or how are schools in the WAC or the other WCC schools that aren't Gonzaga and BYU, like how, how are they going to compete financially in these situations? It's going to be really tough. And if you if if the NCAA is comfortable making it basically just a feeding system where players, the best players at these lower level mid-major programs just end up just all transferring up and getting these new contracts to play at bigger schools, I don't think that that is going to be the NCAA, the way the NCAA wants this to go. But unless they make changes, that is the way that this is going to go. I don't think Gonzaga is going to be a victim in this as often as they have been a victim so far, in part because I think that the roster construction is, a, is part of the wonkiness of Gonzaga's inability to add players up to this point. But I do think that long term, yeah, something's going to have to change, whether it's capping how much money these players can be signed to, whether it's limiting the number of times a player can transfer or not necessarily letting everybody transfer and play right away. I don't know exactly what the answer is. I'm a little bit torn because I think student athletes absolutely 1000% deserve to be paid if they are making money for their university. And I think that student athletes deserve to have the opportunity to transfer and go to another school without penalty. So there are some challenges that need to be knocked out here because I also don't think that it's particularly, uh, it, I don't think it works all that well for schools to be able to brag about, Hey, we just gave this kid $800,000. Anybody else who wants to come to Miami, we can also give you $800,000. That's not the spirit that we're trying to get here. So there's going to be some adjustments that I think are going to be made. I don't have the answers to them. I wish that I did. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be satisfied with whatever answers the NCAA ultimately ends up coming up with. I think it's probably going to be a trial and error period for a while. I'm not overly concerned that it's going to completely hamstring Gonzaga specifically. I think that they're going to make adjustments and figure out how to make this work to their advantage. But I do think that things are going to have to change in time because right now the way that this has gone down is probably not sustainable on a long-term basis. Next question comes from Havila Benjamin on Twitter, who says, what transfer that is currently available and is considering Gonzaga do you think would be the best fit for 
next year's team. My vote is Johnny Broom from Moorhead State, great post player and was top five in the nation in blocks per game last season. Johnny Broom would be awesome. He's second for me. And the only reason I'm still I'm still on team Fardaz Amac, the Utah Valley transfer who's been considering Gonzaga for a very long time. He has yet to make a decision, even though he has been in the transfer portal since the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. Uh, his, his recent social media posts kind of lean Texas Tech. It feels uh, just based on reading that, I don't have any other information other than that, uh, that that's kind of where he's leaning. I know he's met with Gonzaga staff. I know that there was some mutual interest on both sides. So he, he's he's very much in play here. Uh, I pick AMAC over Broom in part because they're both good low post scores. They're both good shot blockers. AMAC is a better outside shooter. Considerably, Broom is just a non-factor. As a three-point shooter, AMAC shot 44% on threes last year. That's a very significant difference. Broom is a better low post scorer than AMAC, and he is a, a better shot blocker, although they're both very good at that. Uh, it would depend on what Drew Timmy was doing. If we're assuming Drew Timmy is leaving, then I think Broom is fine because he's a very highly efficient low post scorer. If Drew Timmy is coming back, I would definitely prefer AMAC because of his outside shooting and because I think Broom and Timmy are, are, are too similar as players, but I think Gonzaga would find a way to make it work were that the situation they found themselves in. There are a couple other big men that are on the transfer portal that are interesting as well. And one of them is in this next question from John via Gmail, who says, lots of buzz around LSU center Efton Reed as the big man Gonzaga is targeting. It is my impression they were in on him in high school before he decided on LSU and he played in the AAU circuit with Rasir Bolton. What do you think of him? Would he be brought in to replace Drew Timmy or play alongside him? Seems as if they have a similar offensive skill set, but might be different on defense. I understand he is visiting Virginia Tech this weekend. How concerned should we be that they are now out in front, not because of their program, but because of NIL deals? I have no idea about the NIL stuff. No idea. I have no idea what Virginia Tech has the ability to offer him if they are just offering a straight contract, if there are other deals out there, or necessarily where Gonzaga is on that situation. So I just, I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that specifically. Uh, and, and and in terms of whether he's brought in to play alongside Drew Timmy or not, it depends what Drew Timmy does. That's not really a question I can answer. I don't think that them looking at Efton Reed is any indication that that Drew Timmy is necessarily leaving or coming back. I don't think that it has a, a strong kind of hold on that situation either way. I think that he would be a better fit if Drew Timmy were not around, uh, just because I think, he, like you said, his skill set would probably be challenging to play at the same time as Drew Timmy. If Drew Timmy, Efton Reed, and Caden Perry all needed minutes next year and none of them can stretch the floor, none of them are outside shooters, that presents a challenge. Obviously, Caden Perry's health is, is a big factor as well and not something that we have a firm answer on. Uh, but I, I Efton Reed would be a nice fit. He's a nice, talented player. He's top 25 in his recruiting class before he went to LSU. He averaged six and a half points, four and a half rebounds in 20 minutes per game last year for the Tigers. I think he'd be a great player to add to Gonzaga's roster. I don't know. He would. It would be a more challenging fit if Drew Timmy were to return, which is perhaps why we have not heard a firm answer from Efton Reed. He may be waiting to see if there's any resolution on that conversation. I know I would be frustrated if I transferred somewhere thinking, hey, I'm going to be the starting center and the primary low post scorer. And then they brought back a player like Drew Timmy and I wasn't going to get that opportunity. So again, this is why I think that we like to ascribe NIL as the reason that things aren't going our way. But I think a lot of it has more to do with just potential concerns about playing time and what that could look like next season. All right, we got more listener submitted questions coming up in the second segment. We're talking more Drew Timmy, we're talking Caden Perry, and we're addressing some of those Big East rumors that have been floating around for a while. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. This is the time of the year that I've pretty much given up on all of my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I actually enjoy eating them. Have you tried the puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, they're not just a protein bar, they're a treat. And they're covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. They have mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and New for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They're all delicious and new flavors are coming out all the time. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. 
Our next partner has a product that I use literally every day. I started taking Athletic Greens because I wanted to see what the hype was about. I've been on it for about five weeks now, and I love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It has kind of a mild tropical taste that I actually look forward to every morning. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole-sourced or excuse me, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, focus, and aging, all of the things. There is so much to love about Athletic Greens. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, while still tasting good. It supports better sleep quality and recovery. It costs you less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. And Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews and has been recommended by professional athletes. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you one free year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash college. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash college to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, still rolling through Mailbag Monday. This next question comes from Chuck Via Gmail, Chuck says, the debate over style of play made me wonder how much that factors into recruiting and transfers. It seems the overly physical, aggressive style doesn't really work at the pro level. Now that there are many former Zags playing professionally, I would like your thoughts on whether players consider that and would rather win the NCAA tournament or be better prepared for a future in basketball. So I think players want to do both. (laughs) I don't think that that's a super controversial take. Uh, I also don't know that Gonzaga, Gonzaga offers both of those things. So I don't, I don't think that players are weighing, well, would I rather win an NCAA tournament or be better prepared for the future in basketball as a argument for or against Gonzaga? I guess I think Gonzaga offers you the ability to prepare yourself for a future in basketball while also having an opportunity to win in the NCAA tournament, which is part of the reason they have been getting some of the top recruits in the entire country because not a lot of programs offer both of those things. Gonzaga's done a great job of prepping guys for the NBA. They, they play a high-octane high style of offense. They're run and gun. They get out and transition more. Uh, they, they just have a style that, that translates better to the NBA than a lot of other teams in the college basketball landscape. I think that players are obviously all at different, different places in their career, different places in their professional aspirations. So some players are more likely to prioritize going to school to just try to win as many games as they can and worry about the professional stuff later. Some guys really only care about the professional stuff. You see that in players who, who are one and done, who didn't particularly care whether their team even did well during the regular season. That's pretty common. Uh, again, players who come to Gonzaga, almost always seem to have both of those desires in mind, but definitely are very willing to, to compromise their, their needs in order to help the team win. Chet Holmgren, you know, did not have to go to a school where there was already a a national player of the year candidate in the front court. He chose to do that. Jalen Suggs went to a school where he, you know, was going to take a little bit of a backseat to Drew Timmy to Corey Kispert in terms of being the high profile scorers. So I think Gonzaga does a really good job of finding players who fit what they like to do. And they've also done a very, very good job of developing those guys into professionals. I don't expect either of those two things to change in the near future. Next question comes from John via Gmail. John says, with Oscar Shubwe taking his name out of the draft and returning to Kentucky, doesn't that bode well for Timmy coming back to Gonzaga? We all know Timmy loves Gonzaga, is doing well with his NIL endorsements. And if Oscar can't get the feedback he wants from an NBA team, could that mean Timmy might not either? Now, I want you to know that I would love Drew Timmy to become a great NBA player since that is his dream, but my hope is that starts after this upcoming season. One more go-round with Timmy. Yeah, I've maintained a belief that Drew Timmy could return. I think his post and his declaration to the NBA draft made it maybe slightly less likely that he's going to return, but I'm still kind of around 50-50 with Drew. I would point out that that Oscar coming back definitely helps. Shubway also was going to get $2 million from returning to college. Drew Timmy's probably not going to get that. And so that could change the conversation. I think the biggest thing for Drew Timmy is a lot of people are saying the same thing is like, well, 
you know, he's going to get the same feedback as, as Shubway and he's not going to be a necessarily a second round pick. Uh, so why wouldn't he come back to school? And it's like, well, what is coming back to school? How is that going to help him? And I think that's part of the conversation that is often not getting discussed enough. Drew Timmy can return to Gonzaga, but is Mark Few going to let him take four to five three-point attempts per game? Probably not. So that aspect of his game, which is a huge knock against him at the professional level, is probably not going to improve at Gonzaga next season. Likewise, his lateral movement and his ability to defend high pick and rolls, yeah, he'll get more opportunities to do that next season, but I don't think that he's got the ability to dramatically improve there either. So coming back to school just takes another year away that he could be playing professionally. So I don't know. I think it's a tough question. Obviously that in the past, that year of not being at the professional level would come with zero compensation. That's not the case this year. He comes back to Gonzaga. He gets compensated a lot, arguably quite, you know, very likely more than he would make if he was a two-way contract guy next season or just a full-on G League player next season. So there are some very compelling reasons for Drew Timmy to return to Gonzaga, and I'm sure that he is weighing them very heavily right now to try to make that decision. But I don't think that him coming back is going to improve his draft stock necessarily, which makes it a bit of a tough sell for him. Next question comes from Larry via Gmail. Larry says, my question this week is about Caden Perry. As you probably know, back injuries can be the demise of athletic pursuits. Tough to totally heal back problems. I'm skeptical he can overcome those issues to be a meaningful contributor. Yeah, I just I just don't have enough information. I, I'm not privy to his medical information. And I'm not going to get access to his medical information. That is a massive HIPAA violation. So not something that we are going to acquire unless Caden Perry makes that information known uh, to the media himself, which is probably not something he is going to do or has any desire to do. So at this point, we just, we don't know. We don't know how healthy he is. Uh, obviously, as you said in your question, back injuries are, they're hard. They're tough. They, they, they tend to linger is the best way to put it. This back injury has already been lingering for a very long time for Caden Perry. I, until we know more, if we ever know more, I'm operating under the assumption that they are doing everything that they can to get him fully 100% healthy in time, in time for the start of the 2022-2023 basketball season, and I'm just going to continue to hope that that ends up being the case. Next question comes from Jordan Quarter at Quarter underscore Jordan on Twitter, who says, there are rumors that we may go to the Big East and that the conference will have two divisions. The West Division would hypothetically be us, Creighton, Marquette, DePaul, and Butler, and two other teams. Who would you like to see as the other two teams and why, and could we survive? Could we survive in the Big East? Absolutely. Gonzaga could survive in the Big East. I'm not sure where, where debate about that even comes from at all. Uh, over the last five years, Gonzaga would pretty, I don't think they'd have finished worse than third in any of these seasons. Yeah, they'll lose more games in the regular season than they would in WCC competition, but Gonzaga is going to be as good or better if they were to join the Big East than they would be. I, I, I don't buy one second that there's any narrative that Gonzaga would not be able to survive uh, any conference in all of basketball, quite frankly, but certainly not uh, the Big East. Uh, in terms of the rest of the stuff, I think we're so far away from any of this stuff being able to, to be come to fruition. Uh, the, the, there's so many questions that need to be answered. What happens to Gonzaga's other sports? How do they handle the travel? Uh, just tons and tons of stuff in terms of other teams. I don't think St. Mary's has the budget to jump into the big East. So I'm not sure that they make a lot of sense. A lot of the other high profile basketball programs that are further out West have football, which makes it even more complicated because schools are not going to jump to the big East for basketball if they can't bring that football team with them. So I'm not sure that there are a lot of other teams that make a ton of sense here that could realistically just realign to a big West version of the big East. So it's kind of it's it's there's a lot of hurdles that need to be overcome for this to even be something that that can be realistically considered uh, in the short term or long term for Gonzaga. Final question of the segment comes from Jacob Quarter Two, who says, when looking at the recent number of head coaches retiring, like Kay, Roy Williams, and Jay Wright, when do you think few will retire? Should we look inside the program or go for an outside hire? Do you have anyone in mind that would be good for the job? A <laughs> lot, lot of questions that I have a hard time answering this week. You guys are put, putting the challenge on me. I have no idea when Mark Few is going to retire. I don't even have a guess. I'm not going to entertain that question with a guess. I just, I don't know. I, it, he has not given any indication that that is something he's thinking about. Jay Wright did not really do that either uh, publicly. So it's hard to say. Uh, I think the plan right now is that Brian Michelson would take over the program should Mark Few leave. Uh, the plan was obviously always for Tommy Lloyd to be in that position. Then Tommy Lloyd got the opportunity to be the head coach at Arizona. 
Michelson has been around this program for a very long time. He is now the associate head coach. Uh, he is a high, he's a phenomenal recruiter, particularly domestically. He is responsible for the tricky trio for Chet Holmgren, for a lot of the high profile American recruits that Gonzaga has, has gotten over the last 10 years or so. Uh, maybe they would try to get Tommy to come back if Mark few were to leave, particularly if that were to happen soon. Uh, I think they would maybe have a chance of getting Tommy to come back, but I, I think that that ship is probably not likely to, to be there for very long. So if Mark Few's around for more than a couple of years, which I think is pretty likely, then I think that the, the next person up would be Brian Michelson. All right, two segments down. We're going to come back in the third segment, answer even more listener submitted questions. But before we do that, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. The 2022 NCAA tournament is in the books with a win secured by Bill Self and the Jayhawks of Kansas. While the Zags unfortunately fell short of the game's pinnacle week, that does not mean fans cannot remain in on the action. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Heck, they even have lines on a fight between Will Smith and Chris Rock, should you be so inclined. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, still answering listener submitted questions for Mailbag Monday. Got a bunch from this week, which I always appreciate during the off season. This next question comes from Jacob Quarter Two, ending the last segment, starting the third segment. He says, where would you say is the best and worst case scenario for Chet in terms of teams who might draft him? So Orlando has always been like the fun pick because of Jalen Suggs, uh, because they've obviously were high school teammates. Just the, the narrative story of them being reunited would be great. Orlando is also really horrible at developing talent, and they particularly have been bad at developing front court talent. So I'm not actually sure that it's a great fit for him, and it's a team that I think a lot of Gonzaga fans would like really celebrate if you went there, but it makes me a little bit nervous that they're not the team that would get the best out of him potential-wise. Houston, I think, is a very good fit. I was on Locked on Rockets with JT Gatlin very recently, and I talked about that fit, where Chet Holmgren could, could conceivably fit in on that team alongside Alperin Sengun, who's fantastic, and Drew Timmy-esque alongside Jalen Green, alongside Kevin Porter. I think that that's a really good fit for Chet, and I think it makes a ton of sense. There's not a ton of pressure on him to, to be a big-time scorer right away. That's what would worry me a little bit about OKC and, frankly, Orlando, is I think the pressure would be on right away, and I'm just not sure that that's a good fit for a 19-year-old kid. Uh, Portland could be good if they pick that high. He'd be a backup center behind Yusuf Nurkic. Uh, Damian Lillard, obviously, is a really phenomenal pick-and-roll partner for anybody in the league, so I think Portland would definitely make some sense. Detroit is another team that I think would be fun too. Chet and Cade with Sadiq Bey on the wing. Really, really fun young nucleus for the Pistons if he were to land there. Next question comes from Josh Edits on Twitter, who says, after his pro days are over, do you see Drew Timmy becoming a big man coach, a la how Don McLean became a skills guy sought after by players prepping for the draft? Timmy's got such elite footwork and low block IQ, it seems he could make athletic bigs even better offensive players. I think he could absolutely do this. I have no idea if he is interested in doing this. I suspect that Drew Timmy has given very few thoughts to what he is going to do after his professional basketball playing career. I think he's pretty focused on whether he is going to start his professional basketball playing career. Uh, Drew Timmy is a, a very good entertainer and a very charismatic person. So I've always wondered if he would potentially go into like broadcasting or podcasting or some kind of like media audio media uh, after his playing career was over if, if that was something that he wanted to do I do think he'd be a great coach and I think he'd be a great one-on-one -on -one coach for low post players but I obviously don't have any insight as to whether that's something he would be considering doing or not next question comes from Nick Francis at music in a blender on Twitter who says what would be your Zags all-time one-year wonder team mine is Brandon Clark Chet Holmgren Jalen Suggs Nigel Williams Goss and Ryan Woolridge so quite frankly, I think four of your starting spots are just locked in. Brandon Clark, Chet Holmgren, Jalen Suggs, Nigel Williams-Goss. They are the four best one-year players in Gonzaga's history, and it's not particularly close. Those are your four guys right there. I, I, I don't think that you could argue that at all. So if you were looking for a lineup, a team to put together 
and you needed to fill that final spot on the roster. While I think Knight, or excuse me, Ryan Woolridge is excellent and very arguably the fifth best player out of one year wonders, he doesn't work in this lineup particularly well. This lineup would be three, three point guards and two centers. I'm just not sure that it works. Just it's, it's not a very good basketball playing lineup. So I think if you were to try to fit a fifth starter into that lineup alongside Williams, Goss, and Suggs on the backcourt and uh, Chet and Brandon Clark in the front court, I think you kind of got three options. You're either looking at Byron Wesley, Jordan Matthews, or Rasir Bolton in that final spot. Wesley's 6'5", the other two are 6'3", so he'd give you a little bit more size which would be kind of nice for that team. You don't want three guys under 6'3 in your starting lineup, uh, but he's also the worst outside shooter of the group, whereas Nigel Williams, Goss, and Jalen Suggs, that's not really their strength. They're not great outside shooters. Chet obviously is a good outside shooter. Clark is not. So I think you'd want to fill that spot with somebody who can light it up from downtown. So I think the best option here is actually Roz Bolton. That's who I think that I would go with if we were just trying to fill that spot. Then you have Brandon Clark and Chet Holmgren, which good luck scoring any points in the paint with both of those two guys starting. I think that they're also a very good starting front court just in terms of their offensive skill sets. Clark, similar to Timmy, is a highly efficient low post scorer. Chet obviously can stretch the floor a little bit. Uh, and then Bolton can be your outside shooter on the wing. And then Suggs and Nigel Williams-Goss are downhill scorers, facilitators, all that stuff. This would be a really, really fun team for the record. And it's not surprising that Gonzaga could put together an elite team of, of one-and-done type players from their program's history. Two more questions. This next one comes from Jacob Quarter, too, who says, will the Zags break the top 10 in the college baseball rankings this season? How about top five? There's a good chance by the time you are listening to this, the Zags have already been ranked in the top 10. They were number 12 heading into this past week. They went three and two. They took a victory from the number two ranked Beavers of Oregon State. They did well against St. Mary's. I think there's a very real chance that by the time you're listening to this, they are a top 10 team, either 10th or 9th right on that line. Top five is going to be tough. There's not that many games left. In the regular season, Gonzaga doesn't have a ton of, like they've played their best teams already for the most part. Uh, so they'd be pretty dependent on other teams losing. My guess is they finish the season between five and 10, maybe in the eight, nine range, which to be clear is incredible. This is the highest ranking this program has ever achieved under coach Metcalf. They've been working at this for a really long time for them to be a top 10 program in the country or right around it. Uh, you know, maybe by the time you're listening to this, they're like 11th or 12th still, but I think that they're, very likely to be a top 10 ranked team at some point this year. And even if they never cross the top five, this has still been a, an otherworldly season for the Gonzaga baseball program. Final question of the show comes from Nick Snyder. Nick Snyder says, how, how about something on Jeremy bigger than life? I met him when my son hosted him on his recruiting trip, could not help liking the guy rest in peace. Yeah. So I wanted to end the show with this. It's kind of a bummer note to end on, but it was, it was not a good week uh, in Gonzaga kind of history for, for some of their sporting events. Uh, Jeremy Eaton was a member of the 1999 team. The first team, of course, for Gonzaga to, to make that run into the NCAA tournament to start the streak. Uh, he died. He, he lost his battle with cancer last week. He's uh, 45 years old, I believe. Uh, I'm going to share links to, to his GoFundMe and, and other resources to potentially help out. He, it's a really sad story. Brenna Green wrote an incredible piece and interviewed him. Uh, last year for Krem 2. I highly suggest checking that out if you haven't. It's a, an emotional time for, for the Gonzaga nation to lose a, a member of the basketball program. 45 is just so young. And beyond that, this is not the only loss that Gonzaga suffered in their community this week. Unfortunately, on Sunday, a few hours before I'm recording this, uh, we learned that Danny Evans, who was the associate head coach for the baseball program, he lost his battle with cancer as well. Uh, he was 41. The two, two people who played at Gonzaga who were affiliated with the Gonzaga program for so long. Evans was an associate head coach, was affiliated with Gonzaga's program for like 19 years, I believe. Uh, to, to lose both of them before their 50th birthday is horrifyingly sad. I, there's no other way to look at it. Cancer sucks. We all know that. Uh, we've heard that phrase. Uh, and it's really rang true this week with how it impacted the Gonzaga program. So thoughts are with them. Prayers are with them. If, if that's something that you do um, and I'm going to share links to the GoFundMe for both Jeremy Eaton and for Danny Evans, for their families. Uh, if you have the ability to donate and, and can help these two people out and their families, that would be obviously much appreciated. Uh, I will plan to donate a little bit to each of them as well, but right now it's just, it's a hard time to be a Gonzaga fan 
to have suffered both of these losses. Uh, it's a very close, tight knit community. And I know that many people out there are, are grieving uh, for the losses of, of both these two people. So as always, be kind, uh, be generous in whatever ability you have to do so. Uh, and I'll post the links to those two things. But uh, it's always a great day to be a Zag. Uh, this was a, a, a tough week. Challenge that a little bit with the losses of Evans and Eaton. Uh, but, you know, the, seeing the outpouring of support for these two gentlemen has kind of proven why it's so great to be a part of this community. All right. On that note, uh, not a happy one, unfortunately. Uh, that is going to do it for me today. We got a lot of fun stuff coming your way this week. We got more of the season in review series. We got a potentially very fun interview. I'm hoping to line that up for this week. Uh, so definitely come back, check that out right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts, available on YouTube as well. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube if you have not already. Finally, thank you again to those of you who have continued to make Locked On Zags your first listen every day. Now is a great time to make your second listen Locked On NBA Draft Podcast. With the college basketball season wrapping up, give Raphael Barlow and a flurry of guests a listen as they prepare for the NBA Draft. Hear thoughts on Chet Holmgren, Paolo Bancaro, and the rest of the NBA's future stars on Locked On NBA Draft, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.